So I'm Dr. Chris Moulin. I'm a senior lecturer in cognitive neuropsychology. And I'm going to talk to you in this podcast about a very fundamental concept in memory and cognitive psychology, which is about the relationship between encoding and retrieval. This is a core concept in cognitive psychology and one that I encounter in my daily life as a memory researcher. So the plan of what I'm going to talk about today is basically got three parts to it. I'm going to start off by introducing you to the three phases of memory, which are encoding, storage and retrieval. I'm going to talk about two classic studies from the 1970s about this kind of topic and the relationship between encoding and retrieval. But I'm trying to illustrate this point with some things that are of interest to students. People are studying and trying to memorize and learn new information. But I'm also going to wrap up by telling you a little bit about contemporary research using memory cues and the ways in which we can help people's memory impairment. There's a photograph on this first slide and this is just to remind me to tell you that psychology is a very new science. And some of these concepts that we talk about in cognitive psychology are only as old as the 1970s, perhaps some of them as old as the 1960s. But as a result, unlike chemistry and physics, the people who came up with the fundamental concepts I'm going to be talking about today are still alive and they're still productive and they're still working. And some of these ideas are very fresh. And it's important to remember that because from our perspective of people who were born after the 1970s, we think of these ideas as old, but they're not. They're very current and alive still. And that's the kind of flavor I want to give you in this podcast. So the three phases of memory all need to be intact in order for you to retrieve some information. The classic question we might ask somebody is, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You can think about what you had for breakfast this morning, but essentially to answer this question, what you need to do is you need to have encoded the information. That means you need to have taken the information in. We often call that study, but you don't study your breakfast, you just eat your breakfast. But to remember it later, you need to have encoded it. It needs to have been registered into your memory bank, so to speak. The middle phase is storage. And in fact, storage is one of the things that we don't know so much about. But it's certain that when the information is encoded, it is stored in some way. Because the final phase is retrieval, and retrieval is just getting the information back out again. So if you're able to tell me what you had for breakfast, it means that these three things are intact, and they're working in unison, and they're working well together. So the story of this podcast is to tell you some of the critical issues in the encoding phase in particular. So one of the things that we know about encoding is that it takes actually quite a lot of effort and attention. But we don't have to walk around like moronic computers so that when we see something we press a save button in order to record it. We can just go about our business and it will be retained and encoded in some way. Godden and Baddeley carried out an influential study on the relationship between encoding and retrieval. So think back to that picture I showed you of the two gentlemen on the first slide. One of those was Alan Baddeley and the other one was Fergus Craig. We'll come back to Fergus Craig in a minute, but this is a study run by Alan Baddeley. And Alan Baddeley is one of the founding fathers of cognitive psychology and certainly human memory studies. And in the 1970s, he was aware of the need for scientists to show the application of his research. And in this way, he was interested in looking at memory performance in natural contexts and with natural materials and whilst people were doing special tasks. One of the things they wanted to know was about memory performance in divers. So his research was looking at the ability to memorize word lists in people on land and underwater. But the interesting thing that Alan Baddeley did was in his experiment he tested people both on land and underwater and he gave materials on land and underwater but he mixed up whether they were tested in the same environment where they'd learned the material or in a different environment. So for example you might learn a list of wo words underwater but then be tested on them when you were back on land. And the details of this experiment are that word lists were administered in each of these locations all the divers did all the different conditions. And the critical thing is the results were really exciting. 
recall from these word lists was about 50% better when you were studying the words and retrieving the words in the same location. So this was a um, kind of a matching between how you encoded the words and how you retrieved the words. So these are divers, they're 20 feet under the water, and if they learn it 20 feet under the water, they remember it better when they're 20 feet under the water. So in order to demonstrate how uh, this theory is relevant in modern terms, we have to go back to memory basics. And I need to tell you about two different forms of memory test. Essentially, these are recall and recognition, and they're two different ways that you can test the same materials. So now I'm going to set you a very brief memory test. The slide you'll now see has got a list of words on it. Pause the video. Don't pause it too long. Don't write them down. Don't cheat. Just have a look at these words and try and remember them. So the first way I can test you is with recall. If you cast your mind back to the words I showed you, just a short list of words, you can try and tell me as many of those words as you can from that list. So you would just be reproducing the words and saying Christmas and so on. You could do that by writing it down or you could do it by saying it out loud, but the principle is the same. You would be reproducing that information and I wouldn't be giving you any clues or any cues, you would just be doing it. The second test is recognition. So now on the slide, I'm giving you another list, and this is a longer list. And it includes all the words I gave you before, plus some new ones. And they're intermixed with each other. And in this task, you would say yes if it's a word I showed you before, and no if it's a new word that I didn't show you before. And in essence, here you have the difference between recall and recognition. Recall is where you produce things, and it's relatively effortful, whereas recognition is just a low-level relatively automatic process of being able to say yes or no whether you encountered the information before. And you might like to think about how those work in the real world and what tasks you do that are recall tasks like in an exam and what are recognition tasks such as uh, bumping into a friend on the street. Why this is important is because in later experiments Badly returned to the diver's idea and compared recall and recognition. And the interesting thing is this context effect only worked on recall and it didn't work on recognition. So recognition was always good no matter what the context was. The context only gave this benefit to memory when you tested people by recall. And naturally enough, this got people thinking about what was different between recall and recognition. And the answer seems to be that context acts as a cue to get people back to the information in order to retrieve it in the recall test, but that doesn't really need to be done in the recognition test.